Coming up on Newsnight, Governor DeSantis budgets more than a billion dollars for teacher pay raises, but unions criticize the state over shortages and salaries for veteran teachers. This week's News in Depth starts now. Hello, I'm Steve Mort and welcome to Newsnight, where we take a deep dive into the stories and issues that matter to Central Florida and how they shape our community. Let's start tonight with the thorny issue of teacher pay. Governor DeSantis Wednesday signed the state's budget for the coming year, starting July 1st. It includes a $240 per student boost in school spending. On Monday, he announced the state would spend another one and a quarter billion dollars on teacher pay raises. He made that announcement while hailing his administration's move amid a staffing shortage in public schools and a near bottom placed ranking for Florida on overall teacher pay, according to the National Education Association. DeSantis also lashed out at teachers' unions that he blames for some of the travails facing the state schools, accusing them of pursuing a political agenda. We had school unions throughout the state that as we have provided more money for teacher salaries, what we've said is it's a categorical amount of money only can go to teacher increasing teacher salaries. Because what happens is they say, oh, teachers need more money, you increase education spending, and then they spend it on bureaucracy and other things. So we said, and the legislature said, only to raise salaries. Well, what some of the school unions did even though that money was available every year July 1st when the new budget takes effect, they would withhold the money to raise salaries for their own teachers they're supposed to represent and try to use that as leverage to get other concessions. And I'm just thinking to myself, the money's already been provided. You should have been working to get that money out the door and get it in the pockets of the people that you purport to represent. But it shows that they put their political agenda uh, ahead of not only the students, which of course they do, but even the teachers that they purport to serve. Governor DeSantis there. U.S. News & World Report has ranked Florida number one in the nation for education for the eighth year in a row. But the governor's attack on unions drew a swift response from the Florida Education Association's Andrew Spahr, who accuses the state of diverting dollars from public to private schools. Florida is facing the worst teacher and staff shortage we have ever seen, leading the nation in the number of teacher and staff vacancies we have in our public schools. I also want to remind you that we have been calling on the legislature and the governor to increase funding for our public schools by two and a half billion dollars for the next seven years so that we can move from the basement in this nation in funding for our schools to top 10. Andrew Spahr, well, those are the points of view from the governor and the union, so let's get into the issue in depth now. Joining me in the studio this week, anchor at Spectrum News 13, Greg Angel. Thanks so much for coming in, Greg. Always a pleasure. Appreciate it today. Carla Ray, uh, investigative reporter and anchor over at uh, WFTV Channel 9. Thanks for being here, Carla. Thank you for having me. Skylar Swisher, reporter at the Orlando Sentinel. Thanks for coming back to the program as well, Skylar. Good to see you today. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Greg, let me start with you on this one. I mean, how does this new tranche of money for, for teacher salaries compare to previous steps taken by the Santos administration. So $1.25 billion the governor is setting aside in this new budget. He signed it. Goes into effect July 1st. $1.25 billion for the specific purpose of increasing teacher wages. Now, what the governor will tell you is it's $200 million more than last year. Yep. And the governor will also tell you that in his time in office, he has been able to increase starting pay for teachers from $40,000 a year to $48,000 a year. Big gap for teachers. But then, as we heard from some of the teacher associations, part of their criticism still of the funding is they say it's not enough. It's also leaving veteran teachers yeah. behind because veteran teachers aren't earning uh, an equal fare, they say, based on experience. Yeah, I want to talk about that, that pay compression issue in a moment. But, Carl, I mean, the, the governor spent a lot of time this week attacking the unions. The unions themselves have a litany of complaints about his administration's records. It, it, it does seem to be that, that both sides in this are kind of blaming each other 
for the same problems, the shortage and, and low pay. Right, and they also use some of the same examples of, of why. The, the unions will blame the governor for restrictions that teachers have been put under, making it more difficult to recruit teachers to our state because they claim that um, teachers are scared to teach certain yeah. curriculum in the schools. The governor will turn around and say that the unions are exaggerating this. They're blowing things out of proportion um, as far as what books are or not allowed in schools and the challenges that those books have been facing. So it has become very political. Yeah, the teachers' union is really saying that those culture war issues have, have kind of been a, a problem for trying to bring in new recruits uh, to the state. Scott, I mean, how does this clash uh, with the teachers' union kind of jive with the overall relationship that the DeSantis administration has with unions in the state. Yeah, so this has been a, a very contentious uh, relationship. And there have been clashes over, you know, school vouchers, yeah. um, reopening schools during COVID-19. Um, and there was also legislation that was passed that essentially uh, makes it easier to decertify a teacher's union if yes. their due paying members fall below 60%. Um, one thing that's kind of worth noting in terms of the politics here is uh, we haven't exactly seen the same sort of rhetoric directed at police unions and firefighter unions, yeah. which um, support the governor and Republicans. Let's break down the, the p points of contention a little more, uh, Greg. I mean, unions say the culture wars, as I mentioned before, of recent years have kind of discouraged teachers from coming to the state. The governor, though, has said that improvements in starting salaries that you referred to have been useful in, in kind of bringing new talent to the state. I mean, what does the shortage actually look like? Well, again, to answer the question, yeah. depends on who you ask. So yeah. there's been some independent studies that show vacancies in Florida are about 5,000. Uh, teachers Union will say it's more than 7,000, and Florida Department of Education says, no, that's not the case. Um, their last release, they said there were about 4,700 vacancies in Florida. And again, Florida Department of Education taking issue with some of the data and, and how it was counted by, by other groups. I think it's also important to note that, again, you talk about politics, that's what teachers talk about, and they also talk about pay, pay and politics. Those are the two issues why so many people are leaving the classroom. And the state has tried to look at ways to get more people into the classroom. Yep. Uh, they waive certain certification requirements. They even set up a special program to, to get veterans, military veterans, into the classroom they to try did. to get them to serve in other ways. But they've not seen much success. That has not moved the needle at all and so when you try to find passionate people who want to be in the classroom a lot of it does seem at least as you talk to the unions pay and politics and as much as you may discount the unions the issue is those are the people who are actually in the classroom. Important to point out, of course, that it's not just Florida that's facing this teacher shortage issue. It's something of a nationwide issue. I want to talk a little bit about that pay compression issue uh, that uh, Greg just mentioned, uh, that gap between new teacher pay and the pay that everyone else gets. Newsnight got reaction this week from Vanessa Skipper of the Brevard Federation of Teachers. We are excited that uh, the average beginning teacher pay in Florida is so high. Unfortunately, the average pay um, for all of the other educators has not risen like new teacher pay. We are 50th in the nature, nation for uh, teacher pay. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is because such an extreme focus was put on beginning teachers and that created a huge wage compression issue. Um, so people could come to Florida, they could start their teaching career in Florida, maybe work five years, get their master's degree, get some experience under their belt, and then move to a state um, who values their teachers and values experience. Vanessa Skipper from the Brevard Federation of Teachers. Carl, I mean, the unions essentially say there's just not enough money around to address this pay compression issue. It does seem to be a key point of contention for them. Right, and the average teacher pay in Florida is low compared to the national average. It's about $54,000 a year, yeah. which is higher than the starting salary for a teacher, but it is about $16,000 less per yeah. year than the national average. Not so a huge, lower. yeah, not a huge difference. And, and teachers saying, you know, as we just heard from Vanessa Skipper, this is just simply not uh, recognizing the experience that right. a lot of teachers have. Certainly an issue we're going to keep watching on the program. It's a fascinating one for sure. You can find the state's announcement on teacher pay raises as well as the National Education Association state rankings for teacher pay on our website. It's all at wcf.org slash newsnight. Okay, next tonight, an agreement on plans to expand Disney World takes effect this week.
The Florida Tourism Oversight District gave the green light to Disney's plan to invest $17 billion, developing more than 17,000 acres of land owned by the company. It's a 15-year agreement that took effect this week and would allow for the construction of a fifth theme park, although Disney's not indicated if it'll build one. It all follows several years of political and legal tensions between Disney and the state during the culture wars of recent years, over control of the special district responsible for roads and other government services covering Disney World, and last-minute development agreements between Disney and the old Reedy Creek board. Political watchers say relations have improved considerably. They've changed the board, and it's held up in court, and now Disney's going along with it. Disney did get in return less threatening director, less threatening board members, more conciliatory words from the governor. Instead of the governor saying, we're going to build a prison or a competing theme park next to your existing Disney World, we are going to uh, support you in expansion because this is great for Florida business. Aubrey well, Jewett from UCF. Okay, Skyler, you've covered this a lot. What a difference a year makes, right, when it comes to uh, relations between Disney and the state. Do you agree with Aubrey Jewett's assessment there? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, we talked to one industry uh, analyst who said it was a huge kiss in makeup. Yeah. I mean, it's been a huge reversal. What do we know about this plan in particular that got the final green light from the, from the new board this week? It's $17 billion. Yeah. What do we know about what's in it? We, we know a lot and we know a little about it. Here's the thing. Uh, you know, Disney is obviously feeling the pressures. They've got Universal right up the road doing yeah. a mass expansion. And the thing to keep in mind with this too, Disney's are, you know, 40 some odd square miles. They've always said a third's been developed with the current parks and resorts, a third future development, and a third of that property set aside for conservation. So this particular project, we're looking at about 17,000 uh, acres. Uh, that's about 27 square miles. We know there's pipeline infrastructure, things like that. But we're years away from, from Disney ever saying, theme park. But it does look like from many uh, people that, that watch the tourism business that that's probably the way things are going. Yeah, I mean, anytime you're talking billions of dollars, I mean, there's an $8 billion commitment for the first 10 years, up to $17 billion over 20 years. That's big time money. And yeah. as was mentioned, when your competitor is adding uh, an entire new theme park, that puts pressure on you to expand and to try to keep up. And it was just back in March that the Central Florida Tourism Oversight District got a new administrator, right, Carl? I mean, remind us about Stephanie Kopoulos' background. Right. So she is well known to Governor Ron DeSantis. She was the former director and uh, senior of Advisor of Legislative Affairs mm. for the governor. She's also the Clay County Manager for eight years um, and former Secretary of Transportation in the state. So she has a lot of infrastructure um, experience, a lot of experience overseeing boards and different personalities and budgets. And I think it was a compromise for both sides, to Skylar's point. Um, this was a soft landing for both Disney and DeSantis. Really fascinating time for those of us that watch Disney. I do want to pivot a little bit to talk about Stephanie Kopoulos' predecessor, Glenn Gilzine, you wrote this week, Skylar, uh, that he's continued to receive payments from that district, even though he's now the Orange County uh, Supervisor of Elections, appointed by the governor, of course. Tell us more about that and, and what you've heard from the board about it. Yeah, so when he left, there were some questions because he was making $400,000 a year yeah. as the administrator of the Central Florida Tourism Oversight District. He took a job for $205,000 as the election supervisor. He's appointed by DeSantis. So the question, you know, obviously comes up, well, why would you take a, a job where you're going to get a significant Such a big pay bump cut? down, yeah. Well, we asked this question a lot. We kept asking, right. well, what exactly <clears throat> is happening with him at the district? Finally, uh, we got a, a, a consulting agreement that he signed um, in uh, March, and it runs from April through the end of the year, and it pays him $20,000 a month. Um, it also specifies that this is a, a part-time arrangement. Okay. It's not to interfere with his uh, full-time job as the election supervisor. Why does the board say it needs that? Um, yeah, so I talked to the board chairman, and he said that, look, um, when you have a transition like this, it's complex, that we needed his insight. Okay. Um, I mean, Gilzine was in the job for but less than a year. Long, yeah. And he also said that this was something they've done with previous uh, administrators. Um, John Classy, he had a kind of a similar arrangement where he stayed on as a special advisor. Um, so that was his explanation when I kind of po posed those questions to the board chairman. Interesting. I mean, Gilzine told Spectrum News 13 back in March that, quote, it is not fair to the taxpayers over in the district for me to be in two different areas at the same time. That seems to be what has been going on. I mean, what do you make about Skyler's reporting? You, you know, I think at the point when I was asking him that question, 
after he had just been announced as Orange County Supervisor of Elections and, and asking him because at that point he was holding both jobs. And so when I asked him, what is the plan? What is the transition plan? And he made it very clear at that point that he was departing CF Tots into Florida Tourism Oversight District yeah. and going to focus uh, wholly and solely on the role of Orange County supervisor of elections. So it's a little hard to tell, but you know some of the responses in, in that conversation, I think he also left the door open to a number of different possibilities, including running for Orange County supervisor of elections. So you know we'll, we'll see what happens come November, right? Um, but it, it is an interesting development that uh, Scotter was able to uncover. But the question from his critics has been how well can he continue to do the job? And there have been questions about how he's performing his job right as supervisor. WFTV reported on one of those concerns just this week. Yeah, we've actually had two boards now come out with concerns, board members rather, yeah. um, of both the Orange County Commission concerned about deadlines for getting the rural boundary question potentially on the ballot. Um, you know, concerns that his office was going to move up that deadline to as soon as this week, when it's typically more like mid-August before those uh, questions have to be answered. And also, since that report that aired on Monday, we've now heard from the school board as well, school board members saying that they were concerned that the sales tax uh, referendum was not going to make it in time and that he had put it under a legal review. That's something that he and his office have denied. But mm. several school board members have come forward saying that their understanding is that it is under legal review. And it's, you know, kind of interesting, too, because you think of other folks, you know, take Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer, for example, as mayor of Orlando. He's sits on, I believe, 16 different boards. Yes. And, and of course, the obligations vary. The Orange vary. County Mayor as well. But, you know, board to board. And it will be interesting to see as, as a lot of folks kind of say, no, we want our supervisor of elections to be solely focused on this one job. Uh, will, you know, Gilzine also look at some of the remarks of Bill Cowles, who left the office, who said, look, I'm leaving this office. My staff they can run themselves. They've got hundreds of years of combined election experience. So it'll be interesting, will they kind of make that kind of argument where I've, I'm staffed with professionals so I can do both. It, it, it'll be interesting to see how this develops and what he does. Such a pivotal time as well this year in this election year for the supervisors. Is it a busy election of year? Elections <laughs> officers, no doubt. Well, meanwhile, we always want to hear your thoughts on the news of the week. Be sure to visit us on social media. We're at WCFTV on Facebook and Instagram. We also have a new handle on X as well. You'll find us there at Newsnight WUCF. Okay, next tonight, human trafficking in Florida. A new law will come into effect in our state next month, which includes human trafficking awareness signage in certain places where it's likely to happen, and new age requirements for performers at adult entertainment establishments. It also includes a Florida-specific human trafficking hotline. There's already a long-standing national hotline operated by a nonprofit called Polaris on behalf of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. But Florida's Attorney General Ashley Moody has been highly critical of that service for only reporting 30 percent of its calls to law enforcement. The National Human Trafficking Hotline is run by an organization that has been taken over by a Columbia Stanford educated, self-described social justice warrior who believes it is no longer necessary for the National Human Trafficking Hotline to report cases directly to law enforcement in Florida. And so when we see organizations that have abandoned their original mission, a hotline that was propped up to help law enforcement rescue survivors, no longer doing that, when you see them pushing a radical agenda an agenda that is proven not to work in city after city and state after state all around our nation, when the goal is to not help law enforcement accomplish their mission, but to obstruct law enforcement in accomplishing their mission, they should be called out and they should be defunded and states need to do what they must to take back that responsibility. Ashley Moody there. While Newsnight spoke with the leader of Polaris, Catherine Chen, she says that 70% of calls to the national hotline are made up of victims who do not want law enforcement involved. We advocate for a single national hotline uh, for one very specific reason, and that's because they can memorize one single number um, and use it anywhere that they happen to be. Um, and we can connect them to a full range of services. But I also think it's really important for folks to know that the newly announced hotline, um, while we welcome any partnership, of course, 
Um, the newly announced hotline is actually a an existing uh, law enforcement hotline. And so the announcement, I think, is really about making sure that folks know they can call that number also um, if they're reporting human trafficking. Calling law enforcement on um, a trafficking situation is a, a resource that has to be available, but it's not a given um, kind of immediate automatic thing that victims and survivors are necessarily going to want law enforcement involved. We've uh, so far this year um, referred nearly 70 situations of human trafficking to Florida law enforcement. Um, and so there's a, you know, a, a very regular drumbeat for us of referring situations. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the, um, the attorney general's press release just didn't didn't address those things. Catherine Chen there from Polaris. Okay, Carly, you've covered uh, the human trafficking issue in Florida. I mean, what do you make of this back and forth uh, that we just heard from the Attorney General, Ashley Moody on one side, Catherine Chen from Polaris on the other side, about that involvement of I, law enforcement? I think we're really missing a very important voice in this conversation, and that is those with lived experience, the yeah. survivors. Um, I've interviewed survivors about this very topic, and they have told me that if the National Human Trafficking Hotline was going to refer everything to law enforcement, they would not have called. Um, and these are these are women with lived experience who say that they don't want that type of hotline. There's a difference between a hotline and a tip line. Um, and tip lines are for law enforcement to receive tips, like yeah. crime line, very important uh, you know, tip line in our community. That would be more appropriate. The hotline is um, for resources, and it needs to be a safe line that, that survivors and victims can call, and it's their decision if they want law enforcement to be involved. And if you talk to law enforcement, too, about this, I know Ashley Moody is representing law enforcement sure. in her statements that she's making, but local law enforcement that I have interviewed about this, the MBI, the sheriff's offices, this is not where they derive their tips about human trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, they're not relying on these hotlines. They are out it, working the community trying to eradicate these crimes. So it, it's not really a major tool for law enforcement, and it historically has not been. That's an interesting point. Uh, Greg, the Attorney General did seem to have a lot of complaints about that national hotline and the way it's run. Yeah, and again, maybe it's just coming down to politics again, because the yeah. argument that she's making is it appears instead of the, the hotline, Polaris uh, filtering and, and kind of creating this clearinghouse of the tips and information that their preference is to have all of the information directly sent, unfiltered to law enforcement. And to Carla's point too, you also need cooperation of victims. Prosecutors will tell you, if you don't have a victim who is cooperating in a case, it's very difficult for law enforcement to, to build the case, pursue the case, make the arrests. And so it's, it's important that there's also that, that positive experience in the sense of, of if, if, if a victim is going to law enforcement, that they are getting the, the care and the attention uh, that they're comfortable with, that they are seeking, um, because ultimately, at the end of the day, you could also destroy potential cases and prosecutions. Not only cases, um, but it can put these these men and women's lives at risk, um, you know, by by reaching out to law enforcement in that way. Yeah. From a political point of view, Skylar, what do you make of the uh, Attorney General's comments there? I mean, she was pretty critical of, of that national hotline. We've certainly heard from those advocacy groups. Yeah. Um, but when this went before the legislature, it wasn't really a, a controversial um, topic. I mean, it, it got pretty much unanimous yeah. support. Um, uh, State Rep Ana Escamani was interviewed on you know, public radio, she voted for it. She was saying she hopes that these hotlines don't conflict. Uh, but it's worth noting when you have a busy uh, slate of legislation, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to get into the, me the, the mechanics and the inner workings uh, of a hotline. Interesting. Interesting that it was a, an area of bipartisan agreement uh, in the legislature there. Few and far between for, for sure. Let's hear a voice in support of the new uh, Florida hotline now. Tomas Lars, the founder and president of United Abolitionists, he says it could help victims by sending a message. I welcome the new hotline because we need both. We need to help those survivors. That's our number one priority at United Abolitionists that are looking for help, um, maybe want to be confidential, uh, their privacy rights, all that to protect that. But we also need to get those bad actors and send that mess, strong message that they're not welcome here. Thomas Lars there from United Abolitionists. Okay, Carla, let's just finish up by taking a step back. I mean, Florida ranks third in the nation. We hear this all the time for calls to the, to the national hotline. 
What is it that makes Florida a magnet for, for human trafficking? And have any of these efforts that you and I as well have, have talked about over the years, are they making an appreciable difference? Well, some would argue that the reason we have more calls to the National Human Trafficking Hotline is because more people are aware of this problem in Florida. Yeah. Um, and so that could be seen actually as a good thing in some ways. Um, but Florida historically has been a hotbed for human trafficking simply because of our number one industry, which is tourism. Um, you know, this is a transient population that moves in and out. Um, a lot Usually of people unnoticed. using hotels. Yes, yeah. hotels, major, major hub for this. And we have seen some improvements to that end. Um, you know, hotels in Florida are now required to train their staff to notice human trafficking and to report it, um, which is a major, major step and something that took a few years in the legislature to actually get passed. We also have legislation in place that's going, um, you know, the rules are being drafted right now and being implemented for human trafficking safe houses to have a set of standards so that it's not like the Wild West when survivors yeah. come out, that there is actual, um, you know, regulatory oversight for those facilities. And we're seeing in this new legislation, you know, the requirement for signage in, mm -hmm. in places like roadside service plazas and in hotels and things like and that. And all of that tends to lead to an increase in those calls to the human trafficking hotline. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that we rank third in the nation. Yeah. Just because other states don't have high reporting numbers doesn't mean it's not doesn't happening. Doesn't mean it's not a problem. No doubt about that. Well, before we go, a reminder to be sure to check out more Newsnight content on our website, wucf.org slash Newsnight, and also on the WUCF YouTube channel at WUCF TV. But that is all the time we have for this week. My thanks to Greg Angel, Spectrum News 13, Carla Ray, WFTV Channel 9, Skylar Swisher from the Orlando Sentinel. Thanks so much for coming in, guys. Nice really to good you. conversation today. We'll see you next Friday night at 8.30 here on WCF from all of us here at Newsnight. Take care and have a great week.